Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, this webinar is going to mostly cover the GRID 2.0 simplified submission process, but we're also going to cover some basic QCDR stuff as well. Um, so let's get started. My name is Zach Smith. I'm with the quality programs here at ACR. You probably know me already if you've been on any of our past webinars. So just a reminder, we're recording the meeting. Uh, afterwards, we'll send a link to the recording as well as the slide deck to all the registrants. That might be um, might take a day or two to get to you. You can enter questions in the Q&A box during the presentation. We'll answer them as they come in and we'll probably have time at the end to read some questions out loud. So um, feel free to submit questions and we'll answer them as they come. So here's what we're gonna to cover today. Uh, we'll just briefly touch on key dates for QCDR. Uh, we're gonna talk about the 2020 MIPS final scores, which were released this month. Uh, we're gonna go over uh, another reminder about the secondary capture submission for DIR, um, then a reminder about topped out measures. And then we're gonna spend the rest of the webinar covering the new submission method for GRID 2.0. And then we'll wrap up with Q&A. So just a reminder about the deadlines for the 2021 MIPS process. As you know, January 1st was the first date that you could begin submitting data for 2021. Um, now coming up in the next couple months, uh, October 31st is your last day to begin submitting data for any of the registries you plan to use. December 31st is when the 2021 MIPS performance period ends. And then you'll have another month beyond December to uh, finalize all your data. So we'd really like you to have everything submitted to us by January 31st. Although we'll still keep submission open. So any data correction you need to do over the month of February that can still be done. So throughout February, you'll want to begin, you know, reviewing your data, making sure all your measures look correct and um, you should be able to begin submitting to CMS around that time. Of course, March 30th, 31st of next year will be the deadline to submit MIPS data. And then sometime in the summer of 2022, you'll be able to review your final feedback report for the 2021 MIPS year. So just a reminder, your MIPS scores are out now. They were released on August 2nd. Uh, which is a little later than usual. They usually come out around July, um, but it was a little, took a little longer this year. Uh, as you may remember, CMS applied an automatic exemption to non-submitters. So if you didn't submit for last year, you were automatically given a neutral payment adjustment and um, you know, you're not gonna suffer any negative adjustments for not submitting. And if you did submit data, you will receive a performance score and you can look at that final score on qpp.cms.gov. Uh, you've got to log in to your CMS account to review that information. So uh, if you need any help with that, I know CMS has some, some documents on their website that can provide some guidance. Uh, if you see that there's an issue with your final score, you are able to submit a targeted review request to CMS. Uh, the deadline for this is October 1st. Um, I do want to mention that CMS recently sent out uh, an email letting, letting everyone know that there's going to be an adjustment to the final scores that were already released. We don't really know any additional information about that, uh, but it could be that maybe something was calculated incorrectly and, and they're going to possibly re-release scores soon. I don't think they've already done that, but uh, we're going to be looking into it and whatever we can find out, we'll keep everybody posted. Um, so anyway, go ahead and log on to qpp.cms.gov and look at your score, see if it looks right. And if, if there's a problem, then look into doing a targeted review. So you might have heard us mention this on our last few webinars, um, but I want to talk a little bit about the DIR secondary capture data submission. So this is relevant to any users who are submitting ACRAD 34, which is the CT dose measure for head, chest, and abdomen exams. Um, 
this can only be submitted through the dose index registry. So uh, if, if you're submitting to DIR and you're participating in MIPS, please pay attention here. So uh, we recommend that you review your interactive standardized dose index report. And we want you to look at how many secondary capture studies you're submitting. Um, there's a problem with submitting via secondary capture, which is that the uh, screen grab that you submit, it doesn't consistently capture all of the characters and, and it can skew your numbers uh, either high or low, uh, which obviously would skew your performance rate pretty significantly if you're submitting a lot of cases via secondary capture. So uh, if you are submitting via secondary capture, look at your dose report. And if you look at the exam search column, you can see uh, what percentage of secondary capture you're submitting. Now, if we find that any users are submitting a high percentage of DIR data via secondary capture, and by high percentage, we mean at least 20%, it's likely that you'll be subjected to some additional data auditing um, beyond the, the regular audit that we do. So um, you probably want to look into correcting this to make sure that uh, you don't have to undergo any additional auditing. So beginning next year in 2022, we are not going to include any secondary capture cases in the denominator for ACRAD 34. So if, if this is a, a large enough percentage of your cases that it would affect your data completeness, then it might affect your ability to get a full score for that measure. Because um, as you know, if data completeness falls below 70%, um, then the measure cannot get a full score. Uh, now CMS has also proposed to raise that completeness threshold to 80% for next year. That's still just a proposal, it's not finalized. But uh, if they raise it to 80, then that means that you'll need to be even more cognizant of how many cases are being submitted via secondary capture. So I just wanna go over how you can check this if you're participating in DIR. So first you'll just start at the nrdr.acr.org homepage. That's the near dear portal where you log in to submit to registries, submit to MIPS and all that stuff. Uh, look at your DIR directory and then click CT standardized dose index. This will open up the, uh, the main interactive report where you can see all of this data. From there, go to the exam search tab and choose whatever corporate account and facility or facilities you want to look at. And of course, remember to set your date to January 1st, 2021 through the present day. From there, you can set the RPID, um, that field, to one of the following. So this will isolate just those cases that are relevant to ACRAD 34. So once you set that, apply your filters, and then you'll see a pie chart that looks like uh, what you see in the bottom right here. So the blue percentage is how many are coming via RDSR. That's what you wanna see. You wanna see a lot of cases submitted via RDSR. And the red is the number submitted via secondary capture. And now you can see additional data if you wanna get uh, a little more granular with, um, with what you're looking at. So you can look at the scatter plot over time view. And that different CT scanners, it'll, it'll, it'll give a symbol for each scanner. And again, the blue represents cases that come via RDSR, red represents secondary capture. You can also mouse over those symbols to see any additional information, like what scanner it came from, what was the, um, you know, what, what numbers were you getting for the dose and so forth. As you can see here on this graph, a lot of the secondary capture uh, cases are concentrated towards the bottom, which is an indicator that there may be a problem with, with the data that's coming via secondary capture. So if you look at your data and you think that you may be submitting a high percentage of cases via secondary capture, then we recommend reaching out to us. Uh, you can get in touch with our DIR team and you know you can look into possibly changing your submission to RDSR, resubmitting any secondary capture data that um, that you had submitted previously. 
So just reach out to us if you need any help with that. Moving on to uh, another little issue for 2021 MIPS reporting. Um, this affects anybody who's reporting measures 360, 405, or 436. So you may or may not know this already, but CMS announced at the beginning of the year that they were removing the CPT code G0297, which was a temporary code for, um, I believe, low-dose lung screening, and they replaced it with the code 71271. This went into effect January 1st this year. Now, the problem was that the measure specs for 2021 were already finalized. So when this change went through, uh, we weren't able to make changes to all of the measures. So some of these measures still include GO297 and they don't include 71271. Um, so unfortunately, we just have to reject any records that come uh, with the GO297 code. Fortunately, this shouldn't affect your numbers too much. We, we ran the numbers with our IT team and we found that only about 26 cases total had been submitted uh, for that code. So um, you probably have thousands of cases relevant to other codes. Um, so no big deal. We just filter it out on our end. It's not gonna affect your data completeness or your performance score or anything like that. Um, now, measure 436 already includes the code 71271. So that one's good to go. Just anything you're reporting for GO297, that should be changed to 71271. Um, but 360 and 405 have not been updated. So next year they will be um, beginning in 2022. But for this year, there's really nothing we can do because those measure specs were already finalized. So moving on to the, uh, the problem of measures being topped out and or removed. Uh, I, I wanna mention that the 2022 MIPS proposed rule has proposed to uh, get rid of two more radiology measures. That's, uh, that's gonna be 195, which is stenosis measurement for carotid imaging and 225, which is reminder system for screening mammograms. Those are definitely two popular measures that uh, I would say most people on this call have probably been submitting. And then of course, several more measures were topped out for 2021 and, and will most likely continue to be topped out and capped at seven points for 2022. So, I mean, one, one of the big things we recommend is submitting as many measures as you can so that you can achieve the high priority bonus for any measures beyond the, the required six. This can help offset that seven point cap a little bit. And just be aware that CMS does like to remove topped out measures after they've been in the program for some amount of time. Um, what ACR is doing to mitigate this is we're looking at some of these measures that we've stewarded and we're looking into possibly updating them, changing the denominator or numerator a little bit, which would sort of reset that benchmark and allow us to uh, you know, keep the measure in the program a little longer. We can't make any guarantees about that, but that's just uh, something that we're working on and, and we're hoping can improve the longevity of some of these measures. Now, this is a good segue into why we want to talk about the GRID 2.0 measures today. Uh, we've got all these measures being removed and capped at seven points. We also have all these new measures that were added in 2020. And uh, a big reason we're doing this simplification effort is to encourage the reporting of these measures, hopefully get them benchmarked as soon as possible so that you can start receiving full credit for them. So if you're not already familiar with these new measures, um, there are seven of them total that were added to the QCDR in 2020. Those include uh, ACRAD 36, which is incidental coronary artery calcification. 37 is interpretation of CT pulmonary angiography for pulmonary embolism. 38 is related to uh, ventricular shunts. 39 is a kidney stone measure. Uh, 40 is structured reporting for prostate MRI, so it's a PIRADS measure. 
41 is use of quantitative criteria in FTG PET imaging. And then finally, ACRAD 42 is surveillance imaging for liver nodules in patients at risk for hepatocellular, hepatocellular carcinoma. So uh, some of these measures you may have already begun submitting. You might have looked at them and decided you'll submit them at some point in the future. Um, but uh, we do encourage you to start submitting them as soon as you can. So when we first added these measures to the program, uh, you were required to be registered for the grid um, and you had to be submitting data through the grid portal to get credit for these measures. So a big, a big thing is that this required us to expand the grid data template, which was originally pretty uh, not too unwieldy before the grid 2.0 measures came about. Um, it was mostly used for the grid turnaround time measures and things like that. But when we added these grid 2.0 measures, we had to start collecting data for new fields like anatomy, clinical focus, patient history, because these new measures required a lot more information. Uh, they, they required information about instantal findings, about um, size of nodules, whether the patient had a history of cancer, anything like that. So some users did begin submitting these measures in 2020, um, but others I think found that the process of implementing these into their system was a little too diff difficult. Um, so what we've decided to do with these measures is to allow you to submit them via the MIPS portal now using a simplified format, which is much more similar to how you submit the MIPS measures. So uh, we've taken all of these measure specs and we've sort of simplified them down into something more familiar to you, similar to a MIPS measure. And if you wanna submit via this method, uh, you don't actually have to be registered for GRID. I do wanna stress that if you want to continue submitting data for these measures through GRID, you, you can still do that. Uh, this is an alternative to that method, but it's not replacing that method entirely. Now, that being said, uh, whichever method you want to report these measures with, whether it's via the grid uh, using the traditional grid template or via the MIPS portal using the simplified template, you have to choose one or the other and report the full year via that method. You can report both ways if you want to, but um, because we're not able to combine the data submitted to the grid with the data submitted to MIPS, uh, you have to submit everything via one of those methods in order to get credit for the measure. Uh, it's just the, the type of data we're collecting is so different between the two formats that we can't really easily combine, you know, say you submit the first half of the year via grid and the second half via MIPS, we're just not able to do that. So uh, if, if you do want to switch to the uh, simplified MIPS method, just make sure you go back and retroactively or retrospectively submit all of your data from the entire year, uh, starting with January 1st. So now I just wanna walk through a couple examples of measures and what we've done to simplify them. So this is ACRAD 36, which is the instantal coronary artery calcification for chest CT measure. So, if you if you look at this document and if you're familiar with MIPS measure specs, you'll see that they're pretty similar. Um, we've we've given you just a list of CPT codes for the denominator. Um, now this this measure originally was uh, it required a lot more data fields in the grid template, so this is just going to require the CPT code and then the numerator code for performance met or performance not met. Of course, that's in addition to the standard information we collect, like the date of exam, patient age, things like that. Um, but all of that stuff is gonna be the same as it is for a MIPS measure. So this measure is probably the simplest. It's just gonna require one CPT code and one numerator code. Um, now this measure does include an exclusion for patients with prior coronary artery bypass grafts or prior um, percutaneous coronary intervention with stent. Uh, we include this, this information in the specs here, so you can filter these 
patients out on your end. That's basically how the MIPS measures work as well. They, they tell you what's excluded, but you don't actually submit the exclusions to us. You just remove that stuff on your end. Now, this is another example of one of the simplified measures. This one uses ICD-10 codes as uh, a way to get some additional denominator information. So this is ACRI 37, the CTPA for pulmonary embolism measure. Um, this denominator is basically the CPT code for CTPA. And then uh, the additional information, which we call the secondary denominator info, is a finding of pulmonary embolism. So these ICD-10 codes here represent whether the patient was found to have a pulmonary embolism. There are no exclusions for this measure. And then just like the previous measure, uh, you've got a performance MET code and a performance not MET code. Now, this is another measure that has been um, relatively popular. Uh, 36, 37, and 40 are the ones that most people have submitted so far, which is part of the reason I wanted to include examples of, of these. But this is the use of structured reporting and prostate MRI measure. Now, this one, we were not really able to use ICD-10 codes to get at the denominator info, which is that this is a prostate screening or surveillance exam. So what we've, what we've done is given you a list of CPT codes, which basically represent a pelvic MRI. And then the secondary denominator info is a made up code that ACR created, which is gonna represent prostate screening or surveillance. So the reason that somebody could be receiving screening or surveillance imaging, it could be a number of things such as elevated PSA, abnormal digital rectal exam, things like that. Um, but because we're not able to provide ICD-10 codes to capture this, we, we leave that to you to uh, figure out how to sort of pull that information from your system, uh, make sure you're capturing the correct patients. And then if, if that patient, if this record is relevant to this measure, is relevant to this measure, then you'll uh, give it the DX040 code. A couple of the other measures work the same way, um, but uh, you know some include ICD-10 codes, and some are going to have the made-up codes. And this is just a screenshot of what the template looks like. If you're familiar with the MIPS measure template, you'll definitely recognize this. The first several fields are all exactly the same as, as the MIPS template. We've got exam date and time, physician group 10, physician NPI, the patient ID, patient age, patient sex, measure number, CPT code. Um, the only thing that's really different is the secondary denominator info column, which is basically analogous to the denominator diagnosis code field in the MIPS template. So this is, uh, in, in the MIPS measures, that's an optional field that you know, some measures require a response and some measures don't. Um, so we've changed it from denominator diagnosis code just because we're capturing a little more information than just uh, like an ICD-10 code in that column. So that's why re we renamed it. Um, but other than that, everything is exactly the same as the MIPS template. You've got the numerator response value and then uh, off screen, you, you can't see it, but the next, uh, next column is just the unique exam ID. Um, we also got rid of the fields for the, um, I believe it was called the extension response and extension response value fields. Those were columns that we added to the MIPS template to meet some requirements for measure 145, but we've actually stopped using those columns. So uh, they're, they're totally inactive on the MIPS template. And for this template, we've just deleted them all together so, so that we don't confuse anybody with them. Now, once you've completed this file, you'll upload it to the MIPS portal using the exact same upload data tab that you use for the MIPS measure template. So there, there's no, uh, no special place you have to go that's, that's going to be different from anything you're already familiar with. You just go straight to upload data, upload the file. The naming convention works pretty much the same as it does for the MIPS measures. Uh, you'll just upload it, and then that data will be processed, and it'll go to your performance report. 
this is just an example of what your template might look like if you were going to submit a record for AC Rad 36, 37, and 40. Um, you'll fill out all the data that's required for AC Rad 36. There's no secondary denominator info required, so that one's blank. For AC RAD 37, an ICD-10 code is required. And for AC RAD 40, a uh, made up DX code is required. So you'll populate the template like that. You'll upload it. Um, and then your data will appear in your performance report. I want to mention that we, uh, we're coding these measures as QAC RAD 36, 37, 40, et cetera. Um, we, we had to add some kind of letter to differentiate them from the measures that come from grid. Uh, similar to what we did uh, with the IR registry, if you if anybody participated in that and anybody remembers, but um, we were allowing users to submit MIPS measures through the IR registry. And those measures that came from the registry, we, we had to add some sort of identifier in front of them so that you could tell that these came from the IR registry while these came from the MIPS registry. So um, same thing here. If you're submitting via grid and via MIPS, you'll see ACRAD 36 show up twice. You'll see ACRAD 36 with no Q. That's going to be uh, data that comes straight from grid. And if you see a Q ACRAD, you'll know that comes from the MIPS portal simplified reporting method. So here's a list of links. And when we send the uh, slides out, you'll be able to click these and, and take a closer look at some of these documents. But we've got the full list of the simplified measure specifications, which includes all seven measures, not just the three that I showed today. Um, we've got a link to the Excel template and the file specifications, as well as the text template and the text file specifications. So just like the MIPS measures, you can submit via Excel or via text template. Um, so with that, we can pretty much wrap up and start taking questions. I just want to give a reminder that you can submit a support ticket to nrdrsupport.acr.org. You can also look at our uh, Fresh Desk articles where we've got articles written about just about everything to do with, with the registries, whether it's MIPS or the traditional NRDR, measure, uh, or NRDR registries. You can also email us at nrdrsupport at acr.org to open a ticket or give us a call with the number below. And of course, we have our QCR information as always at www.acr.org slash QCDR. So with that, we've got about 30 minutes left for questions. Um, so let's take a look at the chat. So I see a question from Sushil about uh, GO297. Um, Sushil says, GO297 is also part of ACRAD18 measure, so shall we remove that one as well? Um, yes. Now, the ACRAD measures are not, when you, when you submit CPT codes for those, those CPT codes aren't, um, they're not finalized by CMS. So if you're submitting GO297 for ACRAD18, you should just change that to the 71271. And I'll get with our grid team to make sure we're, um, we're capturing 71271 for that measure. So, I mean, for anybody else that's curious, I mean, GO297 is no longer in use by CMS at all. So just in general, you should only be billing 71271 and never GO297 um, for anything starting uh, January 1st and, and going forward. Zach, uh -huh. um, they can also through grid report the modality. So if for that G code, they could state it as a B and C T. True, true. It's a good point. Um, 
Um, Sushil asks, in the new grid measure specification, do we have performance rate and decile details? Um, yes, you'll see your performance rate. It'll look just like it does for all the MIPS measures. You'll see the number of cases submitted for the whole group. You'll see the breakdown by individual physician. You'll see how the group scored, how each individual physician scored. And um, I'm not sure if there will be specifically a decile in there yet, because we don't have a lot of historical data for these measures, maybe for 36, 37, and 40. Um, but uh, at the very least, you'll be able to see performance rate. Once we do have a, a decile established, we'll add that in though. Also, if anybody wants to raise their hand, we can unmute you and you can ask your question out loud or just keep using the Q&A box. Judy, is there anything else uh, you wanna mention while we have a minute? Nothing comes to mind other than um, appreciate everybody's efforts to report all the measures that they can, uh, knowing that it's sometimes very burdensome, but hoping to build out um, performance rates for the newer measures so that they may be able to replace the ones that potentially are going away. We've got a hand up from Greg Wirt. So Greg, I'm gonna unmute you. Hey, Greg. I think you've got yourself muted. Hey, are you there? I think we can hear you. It sounds not coming through very well. Can anybody else hear, hear Greg? Is this better? Oh yeah, there you go. Okay, good. So, so my my now I forget my question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, what was I going to say? Oh, what's your what's your what's your take on like the the opportunity that exists for the new. The, the new grid measures in regards to having them benchmarked and what do you like have it have you um been able to see enough um practices submitting the, the, the newer grid measures that there is there could be potential in a quick turnaround and some benchmarking established you know sooner than later that's possible i i know that we received some data for 36 37 and 40 last year. So if we get more submitters this year, those could potentially have a, a full historical benchmark for, um, I guess that would be 2022. I'm not sure if we got enough in 2020, but we may have. I mean, the, the threshold is pretty low to, um, to be counted for a benchmark. So hopefully we did. Um, I mean, some moderately good news is that CMS is considering um, giving a higher weight to new measures. That's something they proposed um, in the 2022 proposed rule. So it, it could be that these new measures might get a score of five instead of three, and that would just be the minimum they could get. And, and of course, they could always receive a higher score if they're able to establish a same year benchmark. So I'm thinking if enough people submit these measures for this year, I would say almost definitely they'll get a same year benchmark. Maybe not all the measures, but the ones with the highest reporting volume, which again, historically have been 36, 37, and 40. Um, but yeah, if enough people submit, it will get a benchmark. And you know, even if it's not a, an official historical benchmark that CMS publishes, they'll still score you based on that benchmark and you can get 10 points if, if you, you know, if enough data comes in. Got it. Got it. So basically to answer your question, fingers crossed. <laughs> right, right. 
I, I just wanted, wanted to see if I could ask a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, with these, you know, with all the ever evolving changes to the program and the scoring methodology, like as you just mentioned, that it's, you know, the CMS has proposed in their um, final rule that won't come out until uh, November that some new measures may have a higher value and start a, a non-benchmark measure at say five points as opposed to historically three points. With with those types of changes, to, um, with those kind kind of changes, uh, I lost my quest. I'll think of it. I'll raise my hand again. Sorry, <laughs> I mean, there there is a lot to discuss with that, um, because they you know we, we like that they proposed the five point floor instead of three points, but in conjunction with that, they've proposed to just not give non-benchmark. Basically, if a measure has been non-benchmarked for over two years, they're just going to stop giving it a score altogether. It would get zero points, which obviously we don't like that. Um, yeah. And we're hoping, you know, we're, we're not sure what they're going to do for measures that were new in 2020 and 2021. You know, because these were these were two years where reporting was maybe not as high as it could have been because of everything surrounding COVID and and all of the uh, allowances that CMS made for non-reporters. So they, they they made it pretty easy to just not participate in MIPS for these last two years. Right. Sure. So um, I guess we'll just have to see what they say. I mean, and and we're submitting a comment letter, of course, and we're gonna give some suggestions for how that can be a little more equitable for, especially for radiologists, you know, any, any specialty groups that, you know, are kind of suffering from measures being removed. Got it, got it. You know, for, for, some, of the, for some of those that, you know, you know, are unaware, like I know that uh, Q, QCDRs and, and the NRDR in particular, you know, your guys are always constantly up against increased regulation, uh, increased compliance standards, data validation processes, all of these wacky terms. Mm -hmm. But I was, I, I wanted to see if you could, you know, for those that may not, and, and because the rules change so much, what are, what, can you review like what those, what CMS, how they define whether a, a, a measure receives benchmarking, what are the parameters that they look at as far as number of tax IDs, number of cases that have to be submitted to then equate to a benchmark. And is that something that's like completely, um, is there a check and balance with CMS that if that threshold is met, um, those parameters are met, then they have, you know, that they must apply a benchmark? That's a good question. I, I know they have there are numbers that are published. Um, I, don't, I don't know them off the top of my head, so I, I can't spit them out right now. Uh, sure. You know, just, it, yes, it's really a 2020 rule, 20 reporters as individuals or groups with at least 20 cases where the uh, data completeness has been met. That's mm -hmm. the basic criteria for establishing a benchmark but CMS does have language that is kind of squishy, like if it's deemed reliable. And um, so it's not a cut and dry 2020, but that is the, the criteria. And in terms of um, validating or, or holding CMS to that, if we watch that, and I know that other measure stewards do as well, watch very closely whether the benchmarks are established knowing the numbers that we've uh, right. that have been submitted. So we do look at that. And if we have question as to why there wasn't a benchmark, we will uh, contact CMS and hopefully no, modify that. that. That's certainly good to know. I know that throughout the, the entire program, I've had, I've, in the back of my mind, I've always, uh, the conspiracy theorists to me always questioning what is there truly a check and balance system in place for <laughs> what CMS publishes for what the for what is followed through with so uh, I definitely appreciate the the um, um, 
you know, the ACR's ability to go back and kind of make you know, hold accountable CMS, you know, if and and make sure you're we're um, looking and recognizing, you know, this data that's being submitted and it should turn into benchmarking as you know to help with the entire program, really. So that's all. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. I mean, we're not always successful. I know when the, um, it was like around the transition time from PQRS to MIPS and the turnaround time measures, um, we know that we knew that there was enough data to benchmark them and they didn't, but, and we had multiple conversations with them. It was basically their ability to do that calculation for the non-proportional measures. And so they, we didn't, it didn't turn out um, to have benchmarks that initial year, but they, they did eventually do it. I think it was the second year that most of the turnaround time measures got benchmarks. So did, we're not always successful, but we work towards that. Absolutely. I, I know I speak for a lot of people when I say we appreciate all your efforts <laughs> when it comes to this stuff. Thanks, Greg. All right, any more questions? Any more hands raised? None yet. I'll give it maybe another minute here in case any more questions come in. Um, I do just want to say um, we're probably just a couple days off from fully opening the submission for, for these grid 2.0 measures. So we, we just have to finalize a few things with IT. Um, it's pretty much ready to go. I just wanna make sure they have the, the most up-to-date version of the codes. Um, so we'll send another email blast out to all of you once, the, uh, once it's officially ready to go. In the meantime, you can look at the specs I sent out and look at the um, template file. You can start pulling the data, populating the templates and just be ready to upload as soon as we give you the go ahead. Uh, it shouldn't be more than another week. I, I think it might even be ready by tomorrow. Um, I just have to confirm. So, so just keep an eye out for more information on that. And it looks like we don't have any other questions or any other hands raised. So I think we can go ahead and wrap up. Uh, I just wanna say thanks again to everybody for joining today. I, I hope you're interested in this new submission method. I hope it'll make it a lot easier on you to, to get some new measures. Um, but as always, just reach out to us if you have any questions and be looking out for an email in the next couple of days with the recording and uh, some more information about how to get started. Thanks everybody. <laughs>